before I get started, how many of you all work directly with mental health people? So I know. Raise your hand. How about indirectly through a health, through primary care? So between the, most of you, in some way, are very familiar with, uh, it looks like, between the two, a lot of you are working with people with mental illness. Why do we have, a, lots of people say, well, why Michigan? Why does Michigan have a depression center? Well, the answer is depression is a huge public health crisis, actually. Major depression in the year 1990, this is starting to get a little bit dated, but in the year 1990, 51 million life years were lived in the world with major depression. That's amazing if you think about it. Okay? It's the leading cause of disability in the world, in terms of, okay? And in 1990, it was the fourth leading cause of economic disease burden, and it's predicted that by the year 2020, it'll be number two. Most people don't realize that. It's second only to heart disease. Those of us who work with depression aren't surprised by this in a way, because Major depression affects every aspect of a person's being. It impacts their emotion and their cognition, their bodily states, and their behavior. There's been lots of progress in our understanding, um, but do we know enough? No. Oops, how do I do this? Next slide. Depression rates are actually increasing, and suicide rates are stable. How are community members addressing these issues? Well, one of the groups that I think um, that she just mentioned that we're working with is the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. Um, where we're organizing, where this group, hey, how many of you have heard of DBSA? Okay. I hadn't really heard much about it before either. DBSA is a, a large network. Um, it's a where they, uh, community organizing, grassroots network, where they do online and peer um, uh, communication, in-person peer communication, and peer specialist training to promote consistent, um, compassionate support for recovering peers. How are community members addressing these issues? DBSA sponsors 400 plus local chapters, 1,000 support groups. They have weekly online support groups. And 5 million members visit their website annually, and they do education and training. How are we addressing these issues? Translational research is the key to healthcare advances. The, Michigan, the mission of the University of Michigan Depression Center is to detect depression and bipolar disorders earlier, treat them more effectively, prevent recurrence and progression, and counteract stigma and improve public policy. At the UM and other institutions, researchers are investigating various types of research like sleep, exercise, and diet, genetics, hormones, family and social ties, race, gender, and age, and many other topics. Our greatest challenge, however, is recruiting participants. I got involved in this project in kind of a weird way. I'm a neuroscience researcher by training, but I've noticed over the course of my career, we spend about 70% of our resources in recruiting participants. So all this fancy you know, fMRI that costs tons of money or the EEG, costs not nearly as much as the costs to re recruit one person. So for example, I used to be at a professor in a university on the East Coast, and we figured out that it averaged, it cost us $500 to recruit each individual participant. Okay, so I did a survey as an associate director, I decided I wanted to help support the research um, teams at the U, and I tried to figure out what exactly do they need. And I found out that here, everyone was having the same problems as I was, and they all were spending tons of resources. So I did a survey, and I found out that people at the U are able to recruit about 25% of the participants that they need. This means that if we had the technology to cure um, major depression in 10 years, it would actually take us 40. 
You know what I mean? What are the recruit? Why don't people participate in research? How many of you participate in research in the last month? Okay. Why not? Well, one, you might not know that we need you, right? Plus, how would you know where to even begin to look? And what if you don't have any illness? Would you even think that you might be needed? No. There's a lot of lack of knowledge. The symptoms of the de um, depression themselves, I mean, this is a problem in all medical illnesses, but it's particularly hard in depression because people with depression have lack of motivation, lack of energy, don't feel like they're very valuable. So it's hard, particularly hard to get them to come in. Stigma, mental health, unlike other medical illnesses, have a stigma. And we have actually asked people why they don't come in, and one is they're afraid that we will know what, that they have an illness or that someone else might have an Ill, know that they have an illness. And oftentimes we have very narrow inclusion and exclusion criteria. So for example, in my studies, we need people who are unmedicated. The vast majority of people who identify as depression, as depressives, get treatment um, with medication. And a distrust of, of researchers and doctors in some individuals and communities. This is even in true in terms of clinicians within our hospital. Oh, people just want participants so they can get publications. They don't really care about people, which is not true. Okay. Also, historically, various groups, um, historical, exploita historical exploitation of various groups has led to distrust of medical institutions. How many of you have heard of the Tuskegee syphilis study? Okay. Um, so I'll just briefly remind you that actually, the, in this case, researchers didn't give these men, black men, syphilis, but they didn't treat them, okay? And they didn't, and they, although the people thought they were in a treatment study. So it's not surprising that African Americans, particularly following this study, would be less likely to want to participate and trust um, traditionally white uh, research community. This, in addition to other factors, um, like ac lack of access to research institutions, lack of targeted recruitment efforts, has led to studies where participants tend to be more white, college educated than the general population. But again, without representative samples and research, we cannot know how well treatments or prevention efforts or diagnostic tools will work in these diverse populations. So solutions must, must address the complexity of the problem. And to do this, we have to have increased communications about protections, regulations, and ethic codes, and research safety. We have to have increased diversity in education and hiring of researchers, and increased listening to participant feedback. So how have others addressed this similar challenges? How many of you have heard of the Army of Women? OK. I highly recommend that all of you look at this website. It's really pretty interesting, actually. The Army of Women was developed by someone named Dr. Suzanne Love, who, and she, in the cancer field, they were having a hard time recruiting participants for breast cancer research. And so she got some support from Avon, and they've developed this whole network of um, women, and men, actually, who um, are helping to participate in um, breast cancer research. Um, and what they do is their goal is to get a million women to sign up, a million people, mostly women, to sign up to participate, to be the army ready to participate in research as it comes along. So far they've been able to enlist about 500,000 people. And so what they do is when the new study comes up, um, and I get these emails, um, maybe a study in Indianapolis. Oh, we're looking for women who are perimenopausal, who are in their 50s, who blah, blah, blah. Okay? If that fits you, would you participate? If not, will you email to someone who will? Okay? And it's been highly, highly successful.